Um, so thank you so much to everybody for being here. Um, we're really delighted that you could join us. Uh, my name is Paul Durish. I'm a Chancellor's Professor at UC Irvine, and I direct the newly established Steckler Center for Responsible, Ethical, and Accessible Technology, or CREATE. So the Steckler Center exists to connect and amplify research going on within the School of ICS, but also broadly across campus around questions of equity, justice, um, impact, and participation in digital cultures. And the formation of CREATE has been enabled by a generous gift from Vincent and Amanda Steckler. And the significance of the gift is that with a stable endowment, the center is in a position to engage in long-term partnerships and long-term programs of research and collaboration. And that's, I think that's really important as we look, not, uh, look beyond the campus and look to the other kinds of uh, um, groups and uh, projects in which we can get involved. So the center kicked off a couple of months ago. Um, has already brought together a lot of faculty and a tremendous group of students um, and sort of had lots of useful and productive conversations. Today's event is our first public event, and I'll say more about today's event in a moment. Um, but first, I want to uh, flag something that's coming up. So this coming Friday, um, Professor Roderick Crooks um, and his graduate student Bono Algado and others will be hosting the second workshop on datafication and community activism, building on a dialogue that they began um, with a similar workshop in 2019. Um, they're hosting a number of panelists and speakers. Um, if you go to the CREATE website, which is create.ics.uci.edu, um, you'll be able to find details on how you can participate and, uh, and what's going on. So, so please do check that out. Um, today, though, first, um, we have our first event, as I say, and we could scarcely have a better person to kick us off than, um, than, than Kate Crawford. So Kate is a leading scholar in the social and political implications of artificial intelligence. Her work has focused on understanding large-scale data systems in the wider context of the history, politics, labor, and the environment. She's a research professor at USC Annenberg a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in New York and is currently the inaugural visiting chair for AI and justice at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. She has an extensive record, as many of our students will know, of influential publications in, in any number of academic venues, but also a program of public writing and public engagement um, that I think is really important in this, uh, this research field. In addition, this is going to get very long now. In addition to her impressive academic output, Kate also has artworks in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Victoria of Albert in London. And um, I happen to know that she is also a musician with a number of albums to her credit. And just in case that isn't enough, I noticed this morning that she also has an entry on IMDb, which means that she may be amongst that select number of people who have both an Erdos number and a Bacon number. Um, which is uh, always, always impressive. So Kate's most recent book, which um, we'll be talking about today, is, um, is the Atlas of AI, which is published this month by Yale University Press. Um, the other person joining today is Jeff Bowker, Chancellor's Professor and Donald Brand Chair of Information and Computer Sciences here at UCI, who of course is well known for pioneering influential work in science and technology studies, and especially in the study of infrastructure and values in design. Um, the event today is sort of set up as a conversation amongst the three of us. Um, uh, there are op other opportunities for participation through the Q&A feature on Zoom, so I'll try and keep an eye on that um, and, and feed other useful other questions into our conversation, depending on how the flow is going. Um, I'm not terribly good at doing that, but I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on it anyway, so, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's available to you. Um, so, Kate, first, congratulations on the book, which is really um, um, marvelous. Uh, and I may wanted to ask you first, maybe just to sort of give the, the big picture to um, the motivations uh, for, especially for the kind of scoping you're doing, which I think is tremendously um, important and a sort of really innovative part of what you're doing. So can you just sort of, you know, give us the, give us the big picture and then we'll kick off from there. Absolutely. And, and look, first of all, can I just say thank you so much for inviting me to have 
Paul, you and Jeff together in a conversation is basically just like my dream. This is fantastic. Your work has just been so influential on my thinking for so long. And congrats on the Create Lab, which sounds very needed uh, in the world right now. Um, I'll just start by noting that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I want to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of this land, past, present and continuing. Um, and to say, yeah, it's just incredibly exciting to be here as I'm launching Atlas of AI um, with people who have just been, you know, so formative in its development. To give you a sense of, of why I wrote this book, in essence, I'm trying to really understand how artificial intelligence is made. And I mean that in, in the widest possible sense. Um, certainly so much of the technical literature, uh, as well as the sort of popular discourse around artificial intelligence, presents a, a set of technical systems that are abstract and ethereal and non-material. Like if, if you do a search right now on Google Images, for example, on artificial intelligence, you'll see a, a set of images of sort of men in suits looking at sort of control panels in the air and lots of, you know, etched uh, sort of etched boards for semiconductors and sort of blue tunnels of numbers. Like this is the way that the popular imaginary of AI has been built um, by the discourses of, sort of marketing and advertising. And so what I really wanted to do was to, to sort of open up that sort of system and ask this harder question of, you know, what is in artificial intelligence made from? And to suggest ultimately that it's neither artificial nor intelligent. And it in fact is both embodied and material and is made from natural resources, human labor, infrastructures, logistics, histories, classifications, um, and really to sort of look at in, in some detail in sort of each one of those particular areas to sort of look through the lenses of data classification, labor exploitation, and environmental costs to see how AI becomes a registry of power. And it's interesting because I, I use this metaphor of the atlas and, and, and obviously atlas is a very you know, unusual types of books. I mean, you can open them up, you can look at the scale of an entire continent or you can zoom in to a mountain range or a city. Um, and, and to me, that idea of leaving the nowhere space of algorithmic abstraction to specific somewheres, you know, those places where people and institutions are making choices, that was a real focus of this book. And I sort of structure it around eight core chapters. Um, in some ways, it's like a stack analysis of AI in the sort of widest possible sense. It starts with the earth and it moves through labor, data, classification, affect, state, power, and ultimately ends in outer space where, you know, so much of this sort of capital and interests is now focused. Um, so, you know, by doing that kind of stack, it, it allowed me to look at AI at very different scales. And also, I think, in some ways, to think about the fault lines of power that sort of run through those, um, because, of course, atlases have always also been um, ways of mapping colonial empires. And by doing that, I guess I'm suggesting that we need new ways to understand the empires of artificial intelligence and, and new theories for thinking about those tectonics of power that drive and dominate it. So that's sort of the, the top level idea of what I'm trying to do in the book. Um, but yeah, over to you. Um, Jeff, maybe I'll hand it to you to, if you want to sort of start us off. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, you know, this is a beautiful book and one that has really made me think in lots of new ways. So I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, and I wanted to start at a very, very high level. And then I, I'm going to make three sets of comments. Um, just take the conversation wherever you'd like to go, Kate and Paul. Um, as a result of those. Uh, the first is about colonialism, which is a metaphor that recurs, and it's a really strong metaphor. Um, and you talk about sort of three, three kinds of colonialism. There is the, um, you know, colonizing the earth. So we get to visit the, you know, the place where you've got that awful lake of shavings from the lithium extraction process. So that's good old fashioned colonial activity. Um, we've then got the dream of the colonization of space, you know, Jeff Bezos and, um, you know, all those good folks who want to colonize space. Um, but then at another point in the book, you make what I think is a really redolent comment where you talk about the enclosure, um, the enclosure acts, and you talk about what big data is doing um, is, or what the big companies are doing is they're enclosing off public information, uh, what used to be part of the common common wheel and turning it into a private good. Um, 
and I really resonate with each of those. For those that don't know the, you know, the kind of British slash European history, the Enclosure Acts were absolutely central to the development of the modern capitalist state. They closed off the commons and turned them into, in, into private land. Um, so, so this is just one question is, you know, a starter is, you know, really quite simple. I mean, is this all the same colonization process? We're talking about three different kinds of colonization. Um, how do they interrelate with each other? Is, is the term colonialism re really apt for everything that you're talking about? I, I get the sense it is. Um, Second, um, all right, a second, I, I really don't know how to put this simply, so let me put it somewhat complexly. Um, it's about temporality, um, where you, 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 you draw attention at one point to what I think is this absolutely marvelous thing about, you know, Google now opening time, um, you know, that, um, you know, we no longer care about, you know, our rock orbiting the sun. That's not how time is defined. It's defined by the computer companies and by the needs of the computer companies. Um, and this relates to your colonization metaphor. I don't think you use Terry Deacon and, uh, or Mitchell in Carbon Democracy, but Timothy Mitchell talks about what we're doing is, what's it, we're extracting from the earth um, in terms of oil and um, oil and carbon and all that good stuff at the rate of 400 years a year, um, or, you know, or 4 million, you know, whatever it is, 4,000 years a year of, of past animal life. Um, so I wonder if you just, you know, talk a little bit more, if we could explore the temporality issue a little bit more. Because um, I was also reminded, and I don't know how this fits in, um, Ursula Sharma's stuff about temporality in the meantime, um, where we've got this image that we're all being trapped in this colonizing time, except the people who aren't trapped in the colonizing time and don't have access to it. Um, so if we could talk a little bit about that. Um, the third issue, I mean, maybe this is a little bit more superficial, but it, it, it just kind of got me. Uh, we talk about Ekman and the facial recognition, bad theories that won't go away, bad theories that won't die. And AI is just full of that. I mean, from the reptile brain and affective computing, you know, through Ekman, um, and then you talk about, you know, you talk about Palantir and you talk about, what's it, um, uh, you know, Karp's thesis being about aggression in the social world. But you could also look at Peter Thiel's thesis, uh, which was about structural functionalism. And, you know, nobody now believes in structural functionism, you know, a la, um, um, blanking on the name, but Talcott Parsons, except maybe someone like Peter Thiel. Um, you know, who's got an enormous amount of power and is peddling a really, you know, outdated, stupid old theory. Um, so I guess, you know, that's, that's the three highlights we might start to explore from. Colonialism and its nature, what's temporality got to do with it, and why the bad theories keep persisting throughout the story. Amazing, Jeff. Like that's that's like the most extraordinary set of three questions um, that you could possibly start with. Uh, so thank you for those. You know, and when it comes to the colonialism thread in the book, the Enclosure Acts is a really sort of important way to start looking at the forms of colonialism that I'm addressing. And it's important here that we're not erasing kind of the ongoing actual colonialism of people and lands. Um, so, you know, what I'm doing in the book is really showing in ways that this is not a metaphor. Um, these are actually connected to genuine ongoing forms of colonialism, land exploitation, mining, etc. Um, and for me, part of doing that work was, rather than sort of talking about it in the abstract, was going to the locations where you could see those overlays happening. And you know, the reason I went out to you know, that specific lithium crystal mine in Nevada in Silver Lake was to really kind of understand this landscape, which has been subject to multiple forms of sort of colonial extraction in order to create what we now see as Silicon Valley and the city of San Francisco, which was you know, literally built from the mines, you know, the same yeah. architectures that were used to sort of carry the miners down into the mines 
in Nevada and California were used to carry workers up in the skyscrapers. You have this sort of inverted mindscapes that, that Gray Brecken writes about in Imperial San Francisco. So I wanted to go there and sort of feel those sort of historical overlays in terms of how colonialism now works. And of course, lithium being this kind of very kind of core component in the making of this sort of banal but essential thing of, you know, batteries and how batteries become part of that backbone of computation that we so rarely hear about and think about. And of course, this is now shifting into a geopolitical lens because you would have noticed that uh, you know, the Biden administration released a, um, a series of concerned statements and an executive order to really look into critical minerals that are sort of part of the supply chains for so many of the things that we use and create. And, and Jeff, I think of your work too in the recent administration's discussion around infrastructure and what is it? I mean, you couldn't have, have predicted a more kind of STS turn in, in contemporary government. So for me to sort of take that back historically and say, what did the Enclosure Acts do? Well, it was about this idea of sort of the common wheel, this idea of you know, publicly owned good becoming privatized. And, and it had limits. It had limits around the land that could be captured, the, the, the forms of enclosure. Now I think with AI, those enclosures can go in far more granular sort of micro enclosures, enclosures of history, enclosures of photography that now become training sets for AI, enclosures of tiny micro movements in the face by you know forms of emotion recognition and now as we discovered this week Jeff Bezos is creating a system for his Amazon factory workers where he's going to be tracking the movements of ligaments and joints to try and reduce the sort of physical extreme physical strain of working in fulfillment centers but to do that of course it means tracking these these tiny motions of the body so to watch that that sort of profound deepening of those logics of, of capture that then create new systems of control. That sort of enclosure to me is a really important way of understanding what artificial intelligence does by this mass harvesting of data and then creation of sort of new platforms. So, so much to be said there, but, but I think starting with enclosure is a really powerful way to do it. Um, your second question sort of brings us to you know, these issues around time, space and time, just the small topics, you know. Um, so for time, that to me was a core part of understanding also that shift in how do we think about what's different and what's the same in, in labor control. And certainly going back to sort of Fortis factories and sort of Taylor's ideas of micromanagements of human bodies, it was always about managing time as well. So we are now seeing this planetary time codes, such as True Time, which is Google's planetary time system for keeping all of its servers in sync. And that idea of creating your own time systems obviously has a very long history. And we can go back to the telegraph here, of course. But what does that do to be sort of within those, those worlds of time and to be outside of them? And I'm so glad you mentioned Ursula Sharma's work. I'm also thinking here of Maurizio Oban's work in the planetary mine. So these ideas of how you conduct mass extraction and, and value extraction through mining is also about time. It's about exploiting the differences in time between markets around the world. Um, so to really bring in sort of time as a sort of modulation of control through AI was a big focus of the book. And then finally, bad theories. Yes, they're, they're all through it. They're sort of stitched and woven through so many systems that all you have to do is really sort of dig in. Sometimes I, I would do that through research papers. Sometimes I would do it by excavating training sets and going, okay, where, where did these images and words come from? What are they meant to represent? What is this weird kind of proxy for? And then try to see what's the theory behind it. Um, so the, the, you know, for me, the, the Ekman idea that there are six universal emotions that we all have and that we show on our faces and that can be, you know, readily interpreted by humans and machines. That article of faith has been criticized since the beginning. You know, I went back to sort of Margaret Mead's critiques in the 70s. You know, it, it's not just now that we're like, this doesn't make sense. It's a long tradition of people critiquing that idea. And yet it gets picked up in computer vision. And why is that? Well, one of the suggestions I make in this book is that it's because that theory fits what the tools could do. It's almost sort of flipping the idea that sort of tools emerge from theories, but also sort of theories emerge from tools. So the fact that computer vision could track 
movements in the face uh, in systems like this, you know, on our Zoom right now, um, oh. and then try to make these kind of, I think, really problematic associations with sort of internal states. So that's, you know, trying to figure out why these systems protect some bad theories over others, I also think is really interesting. But long answer was such a rich set of questions to begin. There's this lovely sort of, I mean, you can see it in these in these cases that, um, you know, the, the questions that Jeff brings up, there's there's a story in here about how things move around, whether they ought to and whether they um, uh, or, or not, uh, um, on, on sort of all levels. One is how those theories move around. Those theories move from places where they have then been thoroughly debunked and rejected, but they live on in um, in our technologies and in and in other um, other kinds of spaces where they have been separated from the from the the, the context that gives them meaning, right? Um, and I and you know I love that although it's a brief it's a brief appearance in the book, but you have my favorite um, case of the uh, what happens when one ignores context entirely, which is the um, the, the case of Fordlandia, um, <laughs> Henry Ford's attempt to build our build a, a, a midwestern town to do, to to be a rubber plant in the Amazonian rainforest in the 1930s. Um, but I always think as a parable about paying no attention to context at all. Um, but then you, it also goes to these, the moving around is also part of these, the sort of environmental justice kinds of concerns that you bring up as well. I remember being, when I was at Xerox Park, there was a point where the, the building down the hill was being um, torn down and rebuilt, it was becoming a new, Xer a new Xerox building. And the process took so long because the amount of remediation, environmental remediation that had to be done from what had previously been a small scale fab line was, was just you know, out, of this, out of this world. People forget that Santa Clara County has more Superfund sites than any other county in the United States, partly through military activity and partly through the environmental consequences of, of early semi semiconductor manufacture. But that doesn't happen anymore. They're not generating any new ones because that's been moved to, um, to other states and other countries in just the same way as we're sort of moving the environmental cost of large scale data processing to, um, to, to other countries. So there's a, there's a thing that runs through this book about how things move around, how ideas move around, how they're held at arm's length. Um, and and that's that's what sort of links the geography and the and the history for me in here, right? Is that about this sort of notion of of circulation and how the how the environment becomes then this place where we get to uh, get to to put those things that we don't necessarily want lying around. Exactly. I, I mean, you know, one of the ideas that I think is really useful there is is Hart and Negri talking about the dual operation of abstraction with extraction. And, and that is, you know, again, a feature of, of information capitalism, but, but you really see it in the, the ways in which artificial intelligence is, is constructed, understood and deployed. It's, it's highly sort of abstracted as a way of masking these very real extractions that drive it in space and in time. And that shifting of the costs to different parts of the world. I mean, of course, if we look at, if you look at the story of what happens with e-waste, which is just horrifying. I was looking at, at something just yesterday that pointed out that 70% of all toxic landfill right now is e-waste. I mean, that's, you know, if you think about cars and everything else that has been sort of sort of thrown into the earth, you know, that 70% is now e-waste. It was, was just shocking. And of course, there's geopolitics there too. You know, China used to be the great dumping ground. It used to take so much e-waste from the rest of the world. But now sort of the toxic overload has become too much. And they're like, they've said no. So now that e-waste is, is being sent to places like Ghana and Pakistan and Malaysia. And you have these, these countries that are trying to deal with poverty by taking these sort of long legacies that completely sort of deracinate the earth. Um, so, you know, those, those threads of abstraction with extraction in AI, I think is, is a way that you could sort of see how those two things are, are always married together. I mean, oh, sorry, go on, Jeff. No, not gone, Paul. Go on. Oh well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I mean, and the fascinating thing in some ways 
Uh, and you know, you point this out yourself that contemporary AI is not the same project than than you know than than the AI that was you know birthed in the late 1950s and and 1960s, um, either technologically or in terms of its um in terms of its its sort of professed goals. And yet, curiously, these same patterns apply, right? And yet, curiously, the same imaginations, the same kind of uh, um, technological account of the human um, um, obtains. And so you, we get this sort of very complicated, um, dynamically structured uh, um, complex of those things, those things that are somehow stable and um, immutable, uh, even at the same time as there's this sort of roiling flux underneath of the actual technical practice, which is just a, a very um, sort of, yeah, I, a confounding idea. I, I love that point and it, and it really, you know, it makes me want to ask you that question back because um, in, in my my sort of tracking of if we look at what AI was sort of in the, you know, as early as sort of the, the 1950s and 60s, but certainly going through the 70s and 80s during the AI winter to what it is now in this sort of rubric of machine learning, um, they're really different approaches from symbolic logic and expert systems to ML, and yet there is this shared sort of frameworks around this idea that we are making intelligence and this idea that you know the the computers and large-scale computational systems are analogs for the human mind you know which is such a profound kind of original sin in the field and it's and it's it's stayed despite this sort of quite radical shifts in, in sort of production and i'm curious why you think that is i mean i mean one of the things that, that i sort of suggest in this book is that it, it it's as simple as this the fact that we use this term artificial intelligence that it sort of it's it freights in with it these ideas of sort of artifice and intelligence that that people still use in machine learning and talk about the fact that ml systems are like you know children and which we're, we're training them just as we would train children i mean and, and and all of the problems that come with that framework but it's incredibly common i'm curious what you think you know in, in terms of how you see it paul and jeff well it's like I had this curious experience a couple of years ago where um, I was on two panels about a month apart in two different countries. And in both of those panels, I, or I was you know, sitting next to a prominent AI researcher from the relevant place. And they both independently said the same thing, which is they said, my research center is concerned with machine learning. It has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. And I thought, again, that sort of distancing was kind of interesting. Now, they were actually both people whose had come into machine learning and statistical approaches of that sort from a different technical uh, technical domain. So they weren't they weren't necessarily people who had arrived and raptured with the notion of capturing um, 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 human intelligence. Um, but nonetheless, there was a sort of distinction to be drawn there. And one of the things that sort of underscores is that contemporary AI is, in many ways, as you point out, it's 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 a it's a product of uh, marketing. It's a product of um, and it's as much in the business plan as it is in the technology and frequently much more in the business plan than it is in the technology. So what the notion of AI enables and what it produces may actually have remarkably little to do with what it is that the technologists are actually actually engaged in. Yeah, yeah a couple of points there if I can, if I can chip in. Um, yeah, one is, <laughs> On this last bit about you know what is AI and did AI ever you know did go fight good old fashioned AI ever go away? Um, I'm reminded of you know someone correcting me about the history of cybernetics years ago, where I said, look, cybernetics died as a discipline um, in the 1950s, and um, yeah, because that was when they tried to have a department of cybernetics at uh, Brunel University in England, and there were certain attempts to build it as a discipline in the states, never worked. Um, and so I, I just bought into that story. Uh, then someone said to me, don't you realize cybernetics never went away? It, you know, it went over to the military, um, did extremely well there. And in the military, they used exactly the same words as the cyberneticians used. They just, and the concepts, they just didn't use the word cybernetics as if that made it better. Um, you know, and I think we see, you know, when, when your person, Paul, is saying, well, you know, we're not doing artificial intelligence, the answer is, well, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to call it that. Um, 
I love this. And, and of course, you know, the way that people describe what they do really depends on, is it funding month? You know, are they sort of pitching this, this lab for, for a particular type of recognition somewhere else? So that, that, that terminology changes all the time. Um, yeah. But even in machine learning, you could say this idea of learning and those metaphors of, of learning are in many cases anthropomorphic as well. Um, and how that sort of slips back into these ideas of intelligence and learning. I, th I think there's there's definitely commonalities there. But Jeff, I love that you're taking us to the military because you know that parallel world of how these systems were developed, for me, you know, the way that I encountered it was actually way back um, when this well, way back, you know, it's, it's still within a decade, but when when uh, uh, Edward Snowden released the, the documents from uh, the NSA and GCHQ. And um, I was given the extraordinary opportunity to, to work with Laura Poitras to, to look at the, that archive as a parallel archive of a history of the making of machine learning and AI as we know it today. Um, and it really is exactly what you said, Jeff. I mean, it, it's not only is it sort of premised on these ideas of cybernetics, but there are drawings that sort of sort of illustrate, you know, the idea of the sort of the cybernetic model of the world and how it could be sort of captured and, and, and surveilled, that it, it could have been drawn exactly from sort of papers in the 1950s. So the way in which we see these kinds of ideas sort of live on through different structures, and then of course those military priorities have in so many ways shaped what we now see as commercial AI. So there were three big priorities um, in the sort of late 20th century coming from the military, which was autonomous vehicles, you know, for, for battle terrain, facial recognition, um, and also this idea of, of text translation. Um, and so where do we see the sort of the, the biggest development, of course, in, in those in those three areas where there's been the most funding from the Department of Defense? Yep. Could I, yeah, I don't want to lose, there's a common in chat I don't want to lose, but not been able to fully process it yet. So let's maybe move there in a second. Um, all right, post the question of what is this a history of? Um, you've got, you know, you very nicely pull us back into Babbage. Um, and you know, Babbage writes what's it, on the economy of machinery and manufacturers, you know, and uses the principle of the division of labor absolutely centrally in designing the analytic engine. He then writes the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise of Fragment, um, you know, which is largely about, um, you know, which is largely about time and temporality in computers. Um, he then um, produces a language for uh, a visual language for describing movements of workers in factories uh, and movements of machines in factories, which is incredibly resonant for me with what Bezos, uh, you know, the description of Bezos doing this kind of tracking of people's, um, you know, fine grained, you know, fine grained movements, muscular movements um, in so called fulfillment centers. Um, what is this a history of? I mean, yeah. That's a hard question because it, it's not an intellectual, you know, you could say, well, yeah, it's an intellectual history, but it's not an intellectual history. It's a history that lives on and through materials, but it lives on through different kinds of material settings. Um, you know, like between B Babbage and Bezos, we've got third links, you know, being created um, what, in the 1920s, Paul, um, 20s or 30s, yeah. 30s, I think. Yeah, thirties. You know, uh, as a way of again, a way of describing all workers' actions. So, you know, well before you've got artificial intelligence, well before you've got this kind of surveillance technology available, there was a desire for it. But you're not telling a history of desire. You're telling a history of something which is very material. So, how do you how do you deal with that? I love this from Babbage to Bezos could have been a, a, a <laughs> subtitle for the book, actually. I, I really like that. I should have thought of that one. Um, you know, Babbage is a key figure here because, you know, just as you said, going back to those those original documents. Um, oh, Jeff, we just lost your picture, but hopefully it will return. Um, it, for me, it's always remarkable to see how many of those threads that sort of Babbage was 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 mining these ideas of computation but also the movement of bodies and machines and making those more efficient and ideas of coordination of time you know that has become this this very core sort of 
history of industrialization, if you will, sort of industrialization through and with computers for the increasing control of labor. Um, so that kind of material uh, political economy um, is certainly, I think, one of the one of the sort of central nodes here. But it is it is extraordinary to me to see how much of those vis early visions of computation were about controlling time and work. And what do we see now in terms of the most, you know, essentially now that the second biggest employer in the US, the fifth biggest employer in the world, Amazon, really driving that vision into a extraordinarily extractive environment, like going inside the so-called fulfillment centers, the irony is, is kind of horrific, um, was one of the things that just really blew me away in researching this book. I mean, just seeing the, the physical cost of being in those spaces, seeing the support bandages, seeing the messages from the workers, which get sort of um, put up on these big screens where people can give feedback. Um, and, you know, some of the, some of the feedback is, is, is really shocking. It's, it's people saying, you know, this is so physically taxing. I don't know how to do this job or I, I, I these, these shifts are too long. And the responses from the company were always versions of thanks for your feedback. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> it was, it was just this kind of horrific set of, of, of signs that you see walking through these spaces. Um, but, you know, for me, again, it's like, are we talking about something new or are we actually talking about a set of relations that was really put into motion um, a long time prior and only now we're starting to see the systems that allow it to be you know essentially effectuated at scale but it's yeah it's a great question i mean i love the i mean there are there are many historical sort of antecedents in in here that you know one that really struck me i think kate i emailed you after i first read the book was um um, since you start off talking about uh, San Francisco as being having been based on based on extraction in many ways, I was sort of thinking of the Hearsts, right? I was thinking of George Hearst, the miner, and then and then William Randolph Hearst, the the, the newspaper baron. And so the, the notion that you proceed from that kind of extractive industry to control over the circulation of information and and you know and the production of different kinds of sort of informational uh, um, circuits, just I mean, it was just very very resonant. Um, in there. But here's another, I mean, the question Jeff asks when we sort of ask about what this is a, a history of in some sense, um, points also in a different direction, which is where do we want to then take it? What are the productive points of engagement for the kind of analysis that you're bringing here? Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, one might ask the, I might sort of imagine that it's sort of the tech industry and tech culture um, and, you know, here we are at the university, so, so um, shape, the shaping of young minds that we engage in, um, you know, that's a point, of, a point of engagement. But then some of the things that we're also saying suggest, well, maybe that's not, because maybe that's not actually where the, 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 I don't want to say rubber hits the road because then I'm back to Fordlandia, but uh, <laughs> that's where you know that's where we gain some gain some purchase. But maybe it's actually you know again in the in the business models. Maybe it's in the broader public discourse. Um, you know what what are they these we were concerned with the ideas that shape the technical discourse, but I think we also need to be concerned with what the ideas are that shape the public discourse with respect to which people evaluate the costs and opportunities associated with, with new sort of technological regimes. So where do we think the most effective points of engagement or, or leverage might be drawing mm -hmm. on the kind of analysis that you're doing? Hmm. I mean, I love this because, you know, in thinking of, of these ideas of what is it a history of and what is to be done and, and sort of thinking about that the histories of control and centralization and computation that sort of thread through this book. Um, the, the question of then what do you do um, is, is, a, is a really important one, because I think we, we have to ask, are there different conceptions of planetary computation, you know, is another is another sort of planetary network possible? Um, and I think it is. And, and, and I think this is something that, that Jeff, you too have been thinking about in your sort of ends of computation project. And, and I think that's a really important thing to bring in here because for me, you know, we, we've seen a, a, all of those early ideas of, of computation and AI, we've seen a version which is just so profoundly sort of surveillance and extractive. It doesn't have to be that way. This is, well, this is the question mark. And, and for me, it was really connecting the lines through 
the forms of activism and advocacy around ideas around climate justice, labor rights, data protection, that are so often seen as very separate kind of communities and separate concerns, can actually be brought together in these kinds of spaces to think about what kinds of worlds are possible. So that to me is where I see an enormous amount of optimism here and excitement, but I, I would love to hear from you, Jeff, around these sorts of different conceptions of, of sensing and understanding the planet and each other that are frankly going to be necessary for the sorts of radical challenges we're going to face, just climate change alone, but um, food security and, and, and so many other things. So I'm, I'm curious, Jeff, to, to bring you in on that one. Well, you reminded me of one of the most embarrassing poets I had giving a talk a few years ago, where I was, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I was banging on about the ends of computing and all, all the negative vision, and I was running short on my talk time. Um, so I cut out the optimism section, which was only two slides long. <laughs> and I felt so guilty for cutting out the optimism. Um, you know, it, it's difficult. It, it, it's, you know, I, and I've been posed this question many times in my work. I mean, this seems to be a dark and, you know, a dark and difficult vision. And yet, you know, I absolutely believe Emma Goldman's statement. What is it? If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. Um, this has to be fun. We have to be dancing. We have to be playing, um, and working out modes of play, you know working out modes of play with each other is I think you know really central. On the other hand, that's a very I mean where I go you know well as you with art. I mean I was thinking as I was reading your book of Graham Harwood and the steam powered computer, which is a fabulous project. Um, how many people does that reach though? I mean what's the you know, it certainly doesn't reach into Bolivia. It certainly doesn't reach in the deserts of Nevada or the difficult to places, difficult to visit even places like the fulfillment centers and the uh, and the server farms, which are so extractive of energy. Um, so how do we get a story in an action uh, which is actually of the same scale and scope as that which we're that that which we're concerned about? And I I don't have a good answer. Except, I think, what Paul is doing and what you are doing, and hopefully, you know, to some extent, what I'm doing is, you know, we're not, none of us are saying computer scientists are the enemy or computers are the enemy. We're all seeking ways of understanding it um, and ways of living together with computers. And I think that's, that's the core for the future is, you know, how do we live with computers? I mean, I would love it. I mean, I, you know, Paul knows more about this technically than I do, but I was really interested a few years ago on, um, you know, the hegemony of von Neumann architecture. Um, there's no reason we should have von Neumann architecture. It's just that, you know, it's like the QWERTY keyboard. Um, it's survived every iteration. And so we now seem to be drawn into the hegemony of uh, uh, von Neumann. And I would love it for us to just abandon, you know, abandon that architecture and rethink architecture. Um, but you've got the install base problem. You've got the fact that we do so many different things, you know, with the basis, with the architecture that we've got. Um, so I think the thing, I mean, it, it, it sounds like a wishy-washy answer, but just to, just to live with what we've got and work out ways of acting in there which introduce the questions of justice, introduce the questions of play um, throughout, throughout our work and throughout our lives. That's not much of an answer, I'm sorry. I wanna to point to a comment that um, uh, Roger Crooks made in the, in, the, in the chat where he's sort of asking, oh, this, will be, this is my version of it, Roderick, so I, with, with apologies, um, <laughs> asking essentially whether there might be useful lessons for us from the differential uptake of different kinds of technologies and the differential public response. So for instance, you know, the fact that you know, you've, we've seen uh, protests result in legislative um, arrangements around facial recognition technologies, but you don't see some of the same kinds of things around autonomous vehicles or various other forms of, of, of data extraction, and whether there might be lessons in there for us about what um, kinds of accommodations people may be comfortable with making and not comfortable with making, how it is they understand these technologies to be um, you know, impactful in their, in their worlds, if it is perhaps 
at the level of the public discourse, or if the public discourse is at least one of the levels at which we need to, to seek some kind of um, engagement, um, are there lessons in there perhaps? That's a great question, Roderick, and I, know I want to start with that and then, and then loop back to, to the points you were making, Jeff, because it is really hard, but it's really important that we have those conversations. So I'm so glad that you opened up some of those, I think, really rich options for thinking differently um, with the infrastructures we have. Um, but this is a great point in terms of why facial recognition has become a real focal point for resistance and a politics of refusal in a way that, you know, a lot of backend databases are not because they're, they're, you, you don't see them, they, they somehow feel less um, intimate in terms of what they're capturing and, and what they're using from us. And, and in that sense, I think so facial recognition has become like the facial rec is the megafauna um, of these systems because it's large and you can understand it and it connects to the face. Whereas something like you know training sets, Again, they, they're just seen as infrastructures, not things that that actually contain politics that need to be questioned. And the other thing that's really interesting about this question is if you look at the places where facial recognition has been banned, so Oakland, Somerville, um, you know, Portland, um, you, you're looking at sort of sp small populations that are generally pretty affluent and and have a lot of political capital, like how does that scale across the many other towns and cities that sort of don't have big campaigns working around facial recognition? So how do we think about ideas of scale in refusal in the same way that we have scale of these systems? And, and, and this is a question that I've been thinking about recently with uh, Michael Medeo and Mike Anani. It's, 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 a, it's a really hard problem, um, is, is where do you sort of think about both sort of the recognition of a system and then how do you sort of scale a response to it? But Let's start, yeah, Jeff. Uh, so, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll complicate things a little bit more before you respond. Uh, no, because I love that response. Um, the megafauna, that, that is a fantastic image for it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's what we all care about, the charismatic me megafauna, and it's what's going on underneath that really matters. And you're reminding me of a really great book that I just finished by Bruce Clark, I don't know if you know it, about neo-cybernetics and um, uh, Lynn Margulis. Um, and one of the things I loved about his bringing together cybernetics and Lynn Margulis was Lynn Margulis saying, when you get right down to it, at the very small scale, you find symbiosis is at the centre of existence, biological existence. It's only when you start to scale up um, that you start to get all these overlays and super additions. Um, so, you know, so again, you know, that, that maybe suggests that it's exactly what you're suggesting in the book. Let's not be, you know, dazzled by the, by the very large scale. Let's get down there and then we might discover a different reality underneath it. Yes, exactly. And, and, and that was, you know, really where I was responding to your work in the sort of the ends of computation as well, is that I think it, it forces us to say, what happens to symbiosis? What happens to forms of thinking that are embedded in an ecology rather than sort of scaled with logics of, you know, essentially, if you look at something like reinforcement learning, like sort of an agent that's rational, that's seeking a reward, you know, what, where did these ideas come from? What happens when you build technical systems based upon them? And could we have a different kind of machine learning with different precepts? And I think Anna Singh's work on sort of anti-scale thinking is super important here. And I know we've we've talked about sort of mushrooms and mycelium networks, Jeff, and, and you know, and how like, you know, and, and the way the sort of like networks of, of mutual aid that you see in terms of the relationships of mushrooms to trees, what if we were using different metaphors at the core level of how computing is understood? Mm. Um, and you know, and, and this is something that sort of Wendy Chun is also really interesting on this. She's like, if we're, if we're creating machine learning systems purely on the data of the past, then we're in real trouble because we're, we're bringing in all of that, that deep and profound forms of this sort of structural racism and sexism and so many of the other things that just get, get sort of shifted in with it. We have to have different models. And, and it really gets down to those core ideas of, you know, how are we modeling the world in these systems? What are the politics there? And can they be otherwise? And I, I do believe they can, but I want to agree with you, Jeff, it's, it's hard, but it is something that can be done. We can look at these sort of different models. I'm reminded of um, a point I saw uh, 
Brian Cantwell Smith make in that talk where he, he's, you know, going back to a sort of Cartesian separation between mechanism and meaning um, and, and observing that um, that although the principles of computation are fundamental, I mean, the theories of computation are fundamentally theories of mechanism, right? They're theories of, um, of bumping and shoving, as he puts it. Um, the, the language of computation is the language of meaning. It's, it's, it is. It's, it's language, representation, symbol, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's um, reference. It's, 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 all, it's, it's all at Descartes' upper level and not at Descartes' lower level. And in some sense, sort of like, there may be, uh, I mean, there may be a grand project of reunification to be um, to be imagined that um, resists a separation between those two, um, and certainly resists the project of remapping one level into the into the other. I mean, this is a. I get to use these to, as, as as ways of figuring out what to teach in my class, but it's like I'm teaching a class around technology and ethics right now, and one of the fundamental things we keep coming back to is the very idea that that the the terminology makes it um, seem as though ex ethics and technology are somehow two different things, such that there's technology that's proceeding, and now we need ethics over here to come and say something about it, and there's no other domain of human existence, whether it's, you know, parenting or being a neighbor or driving your car in which we imagine that these things are somehow separated from each other that it's like well i'm trained on how to drive my car but i'm not trained on how to be ethical about it it's just not an, an acceptable position um, um and so there may be uh I mean, it's, it's interesting to to take some of the, the the issues, Kate, that you're raising, and then ask whether there are some some deep conceptual separations, some disciplinary separations that are no longer sustainable in the context of the the sort of acceleration of, of digital technologies that we're seeing. Absolutely, and, and and I think that that Cartesian dualism, which is sort of foundational in these fields, this idea that you can sort of have a separated intelligence away from you know, bodies and the earth and ecologies you know there's so much there's so much to sort of really change there if we and if we could i think we'd start to open these different questions but instead in, in tracing the history of ideas and ai you see this desire for something much closer to a, a sort of a full capture of the earth which is then sort of put in this sort of intelligence bucket so woody bledslow who you know was one of the first people to start working on facial recognition back in the 60s you know has this term where he describes that one day AI will be the only science. So it's, you know, this complete kind of centralization of this one, one sort of technical discipline, at sort of uber alles, which is, I think, such a sort of a, a problematic sort of recurring idea. Um, and in it comes these ideas of sort of mapping the world, which came again, was the exact term that, uh, that Professor Fei-Fei Li used when she was creating ImageNet, is it was designed to map the entire world of objects. Well, what, what does that mean when what you're actually doing is scraping the internet for like 14 million images and putting them into WordNet categories? Like, how is that mapping the world? And, and in that slippage, how are you understanding the world? So it's, it's that at that level of those core questions of what's being modeled, and how it's being done, that I think we can find different paths um, that will hopefully get out of these very problematic and dangerous cul-de-sacs that we're in now. Yeah, one, yeah, yeah, one, one quick point on that. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I'm gonna run a kind of line that Bruno Latour runs at one point on the Parliament of Things. Uh, that for me, one of the things that's key in that is that it's not only, let's all be nice with each other, and the rest of the world will take care of itself. Um, you know, I think that that is part of the Cartesian dualism that Paul was rightly pointing out. We've got to be as good with the earth, as good with our materials, as good with, you know, micro flora and fauna as we would wish to be with each other. It's not, you know, one ethics for one thing, you know, one ethics for us and another ethics for the material world. And that for me is a, it's such a persistent, logic it's very very hard to get around it but it's but it's you know absolutely important um but all right does lead me to a question though i mean this is getting back to your temporality point and i, I know you'll recognize this from my some stuff i'm doing kate but uh i mean some of these machines they are operating at a level of temporality i have no access to mm -hmm. they're making decisions way way faster than i can think i mean i just live right you know, more or less one per second on a good day, you know, is, you know, is, you know, it's my rhythm of living, um, you know, and these things are doing, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of millions of operations per second. I mean, this is not a level playing field. I mean, so I guess two separate points, but how do we how do we level the playing field a little bit? Right. I mean, look, it's funny thinking about sort of rhythms of living. If if there's the pandemic has really brought something to my attention, <laughs> that they, my my temperament very slow. If I could get a few things done in a day, that's a time. <laughs> it feels like we're all kind of moving in in like a, a much more viscous right. fluid than we were even as, as recently as a year ago. Um, absolutely, there are very different sort of capacities to to shift and access time I mean you know many years ago I wrote a paper with Tara Carpi um, thinking about uh, essentially trading algorithms and these emergence of new ecologies of trading algorithms that Donald McKenzie and, and others are now doing yeah. some really great deep dives into and 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 yes absolutely that is you know not only a temporality that we don't have access to but a temporality that's starting to feed on itself in ways that are, are ultimately not not governable um, in the way that you might understand sort of the governance of technical systems. They are sort of creating their own logics in these sorts of weird spaces. Now, obviously, people still are forming those systems. So by no means are they sort of intelligent or doing things entirely by themselves. But they are creating these sort of ecologies, which are sort of operating outside of a kind of a, a, a traditional human logic of temporality that we can easily access but i don't want that to mystify these systems in a way that we say well you know we're getting towards something like a super intelligence or they're just so much better than we are because they're faster um that division again would, would i think sort of leads us down a leads us down a bad path rather than saying what are the ways in which temporality is going to need to be constructed differently given the, the challenges that we're facing and how does that sort of shift the sorts of systems we want to construct and I think that's where we get back to, to, to your work, Jeff, on, on sort of these ideas of other types of autopoesis in systems. Um, and I love that you brought us back to art and dancing. Uh, one of my sort of you know, favorite things has obviously been collaborating with artists in the last few years to, to, to address and, and sometimes visualize these ideas. But Trevor Paglin, who's um, an artist who's done a lot of work in this space, when he's often put this question, it's like, well, art's really going to fix this. This is something that artists can do. He's, his response is always, Oh yeah, which artists? Do, do, do you want to name? Like, which are the ones that will be sort of fixing this for us? Because like, this is not our job. <laughs> this is not actually, what we do. you know. Uh, and and I think that's a really good point. Is like, where does you know where does responsibility vest in terms of how we're going to sort of do this this reimagining work and then make it possible? Because artists are like, look, you know, which which ones of us are supposed to be fixing this now? Which I thought was a really great response. <laughs> that's great. I want to. I'm. I'm. I'm conscious that we're getting close to the top of the hour, um, and I want to. You know, there's only so much zooming that most people can manage, and so. So I want to. Even though there's so much more we could talk about, I want to uh, um, start to close things up. But I want to close perhaps by pointing to, actually, Kate, how you close the book. The the coda of the book is this remarkable, resonant, um, uh, creepy story of being slowly and anonymously escorted off the uh of the actually just out of the sight lines i think of um of the blue origin uh um space facility and it raises question it raises two questions for me right so, so one is um uh going to something that jeff was just saying how do we have access to um, the, 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 the spaces of deliberation, right? How can we open those up ourselves? Um, and then the other is just this idea that, that doing some of this work involves placing oneself in awkward situations and in uncomfortable um, places where, where, where people may or may not be, um, you may or may not be welcomed or and greeted with open with open arms, and I think it's like I don't I, I don't know if that was your purpose, Kate, but that's very much what I took away from the closing with this with this particular um the, the particular kind of images you leave us with. Right. I mean, look, it, it, for me, the coda was is was really trying to follow the ideology of you know extraction and permanent growth that underline so many of these sort of big tech companies uh, that, that run AI in the world. And certainly for the, the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks, it, it, it really is a vision of continuing growth by using space, either as the next mining frontier or as a place to offset humans so that we live in these giant sort of rotational satellite rings while only the very wealthy can sort of continue to live on Earth. And it's such a terrifying vision that, you know, by making all of this money, sort of extracting billions of dollars that they're like, well, now we're just going to leave. 
know that that's that's the extent of the sort of responsibility to the earth um, and and the degree to which that's premised on just a complete impossibility like we don't have the tools to live on mars and yet that is what elon musk is is really selling um so for me what i was like look to understand something like Blue Origin, this, this, this company, which is the next trajectory for, for Jeff Bezos. I had to go there and I wanted to photograph uh, the reusable rocket base that's in the ex huge ancient Permian Basin in West Texas. And it's this extraordinary desert landscape, it's vast. But I found this one piece of public land where you can sort of get an, an angle and an aspect to take a photograph of this base. And I did all the research, I knew it was public land. Um, and it was sort of seeing in the distance these sort of two black pickup trucks sort of coming towards me. And I was like, here we go. Just enough time to sort of get in the car and start moving and then to be escorted out of the valley, you know, by these sort of completely kind of terrifying vehicles, like just tailgating me all the way out until I left. It was this experience of exactly that same sort of enclosure that we we're talking about earlier. It's like, this is a public road, this is public land, but it's it's near the sort of the, the Bezos space facility and is therefore, you know, not to be explored or to be photographed. And that is what's also happening with space. You know, space is in theory, according to sort of the, the, the treaties that we've had sort of for, for many decades now, a publicly owned space but now of course you can mine there and there have been all of these sort of lobbying efforts to create space as another privatized space and we have a privatized space race now so that that end of the book for me was was not just literally a very uncomfortable experience as you say um of sort of realizing that one is one is not welcome in these spaces of you know capital or technology but, but also the, the logics that underlie them, this idea of this is how we're going to continue our plan of harvesting and extraction, even when the earth is at a limit. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, again, I think it speaks to, um, yeah, this, 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 this question of the, the, the discomforts to which we must expose ourselves in order to build um, the build build the futures the futures that we want or the futures worth worth wanting um, in um, in Shannon Valor's terms. So um, we were listing earlier as we were sort of discussing um, before people came on the you know the various awkwardnesses of Zoom life and one of the awkwardnesses of Zoom life is that there's no applause in Zoom life. <laughs> we have we have a, we've had an audience of you know up to about ninety people and yet you will not hear their appreciation. So it falls on me then to. Um, to channel them and thank you so much for um, for this conversation and for sort of like you know getting getting things started for our center in such a um, provocative and and useful way. Um, it's been it's been really marvelous. Thank you so much. And a giant thank you to you, Jeff and Paul. A applause to you both um, for everything that you've been doing for so long and for really giving us different ways of thinking about these issues. I'm forever indebted and super excited to see what you're gonna be doing with the new center. So thank you and thanks everyone for joining.